Hey there, welcome to Almond Bread. I want to make maths fun for people who already love it. But enough blah blah, let's get right to it. We are going to discuss the row function. It is a function I stumbled across while I was working on a motion planner for a super high precision positioning device. But before we dive into the meat of the matter, let me give you a little bit of background about motion planning. Or, as we fancy people say, trajectory generation. So let's assume we have an object and we want to get it from location A to location B. How do we do that? Well, if we lived in an ideal pure maths world, we could just beam it over. But since we don't, we can't. Things can only change location with a certain location change rate, commonly referred to as velocity. So let's say we live in a slightly more realistic scenario and the velocity of our thing is limited. If we wanted to get it from A to B as fast as possible under these new circumstances, we would make the thing move from A as fast as it can as soon as time starts and then we would instantly make it stop once we've reached B. What would that look like on a graph? We will call the time t and the location x. To make our lives easier, we say location A is at x equals 0 and location B is at x equals 1. Units don't matter, units are for physicists. We set the maximum velocity of our thing to 1, we start moving at t equals 0 and we will have reached the target at t equals 1. If we take a look at the velocity over time, it is just 1 while we move and 0 before and after. However, turns out this is still not how things can behave in the real world. Instantly changing velocity requires infinite force. Chuck Norris joke goes here. So we can only change a thing's velocity with a certain velocity change rate or acceleration. For the sake of where I'm going with this, we assume that the track is too short to reach maximum velocity. That means we start at our start location x equals zero, floor the gas pedal as soon as the light turns green, accelerate until we reach the middle of the track at one half, immediately hit the brakes and decelerate until we come to halt at x equals one. This is what the curves over time look like. We pick a maximum acceleration and deceleration of 4, so the time we need to cover the whole track is still 1. A set maximum acceleration until half of the track, which is also half of the time here, and then braking until we stand. Velocity wise, we have a rising velocity until mid track, then descending until it reaches 0. Our covered track over time becomes a smooth parabola chunk until the middle and then a second parabola chunk until the end. Nice! We have already achieved a good video game level of realism and it is enough for many real world applications. However, in many other real world applications it helps to limit an even higher derivative of the location with respect to time. For instance when we have a system that is prone to vibration or oscillations, like a crane or something of that kind of sort. A smooth motion reduces the dangling, which is what we usually want. What do we do here? Well, it means we have to slowly increase our acceleration until some point, decrease it back to zero, which is where we have to be in the middle of the track, having reached peak velocity for an instance, gradually decelerate and then reduce the deceleration back to zero at the end. So let's graph the shit out of that motion. We begin with the derivative of the acceleration. It's called jerk, which is not funny. We always pick the limits so that we reach x equals 1 at t equals 1, which means we have a total, jer <laughs> total jerk of 32 in this case. During the first half of the first half, we are increasing the acceleration as fast as we can, meaning we keep the jerk at maximum. Then, during the second half of the first half, we want to decrease the acceleration back to zero again, meaning we max out the jerk into the negative direction. For the deceleration phase, we do the opposite. We first keep the jerk at negative maximum and then at positive maximum. The acceleration curve looks accordingly, increasing as long as the jerk is positive, then decreasing back to zero when we have reached the middle of the track at half time, then further decreasing, now decelerating, until we have reached maximum deceleration and increasing back to zero. This creates a beautifully smooth velocity curve that consists out of four parabola segments and an even more beautifully smooth position curve puzzled together from four cubic function segments. However, 
If we want to do ultra high accuracy motion planning on atom level crazy high precision, like they probably needed for this a boy and his atom animation, we go yet another level further. We limit the fourth derivative of our location with respect to time, which is the change rate of the jerk or the acceleration of the acceleration if you will. Some call it snap, some call it jounce. We will rather call it snap since the letter J is already occupied by jerk. So let me torture you with the graphs. The snap goes up and down between upper and lower maximum like crazy. The jounce looks kind of like it did before, except with triangles instead of rectangles. The acceleration also looks kind of like before, except now it has a curvy mountain and a curvy valley instead of triangly sharpness. The velocity... Well hang on, you think. We are no longer time optimal, are we? Why do we need this acceleration plateau in the middle? Wouldn't it be better to just stay at maximum negative jerk and cruise right through the t-axis? And you are right, we are no longer time optimal. But screw it! Maybe we just want a little acceleration plateau to breathe in this faster and faster moving world that has become all about efficiency. Anyway, the velocity becomes this a little bit smoother than before bump and the position curve looks almost exactly like it did before, making normal people question why anyone would go to such lengths in the first place. But as mathematicians, we rather think, why stop there? Let's say that at some point in the future we want to knit two superstrings together. We will probably have to limit the seventh time derivative of the position of our superstring needle. This time we start looking at the position curve. Oh my god, so smooth. Okay, velocity. Mm -hmm. Acceleration. Okay, makes sense. Looks a bit like the velocity, except with another downward dent also. Jerk. Well, hang on a second. Snap. Doesn't mean we just... Crackle, pop, snap jerk. Well, somehow the first six curves look very similar. How far can we go with this? And here comes the definition of the row function. Pay attention now, this will be in the exam. We just take the position curve from before and use it to puzzle together the velocity curve of the next iteration, which is what we kind of secretly did all along. If you don't believe me, the power of rewinding the video is right at your fingertips. What do I mean by puzzle? I mean that we just take the position curve of the last iteration, scale it to half the width along the time axis, scale it to twice the height on the position axis, then we append a flipped version of itself to itself and BAM! Velocity curve of the next iteration trajectory. How do we get to the position curve from that? Well, just like normal people would do by integrating. You know how it is modern to be all like, but I'm not going to torture you with equations and formulas, usually followed by a coquettish laughter like, <laughs> and then you're left all disappointed? Well, not on my channel, because we are going to work through all those beautiful equations and formulae. Here we go. So, x as a function of t is our position curve, and the little index indicates the iteration. As said, the derivative of the next iteration is the same curve as the position curve of the iteration before, except twice as high and half as wide. Ironically, we have to multiply both x and t with 2 for that, although we stretch along the x-axis and shrink along t, but that's just how math works, I didn't invent it. So we do that if our t is between 0 and a half. Between a half and 1 we use the reflected version, which we do like this. And then we integrate. But how do we start, you think? For the zeroth iteration, we can pick x equals one half. It does not exactly model that beaming process that we were talking about in the beginning, but all following iterations match very well with our motion examples. Now we just keep doing this forever. When we are done, we arrive at the row function. Let's see what we get if we do this analytically. I used live.sympy.org to help me with this, because I always mess things up with pen and paper. Okay, so we start out with x0 being one half. Scaling, flipping and integrating, which is so far not that difficult, we obtain x1 equals t. Next, we get two parabola segments, one until half time and one until the end. The notation for the next iteration is a bit weird, but I'm sure that Simpy knows what it's doing. We get four pieces of cubic functions. If we continue, the polynomial degree of our function increases by one for every iteration. 
and we get more and more pieces. But it also becomes smoother and smoother. Let's see what this looks like. Here's x0 being a half. This time I use the ruler for the line. x1 equals t, x2, two parabola segments, x3, four cubic segments, already looking very similar. And here we have x10, thousand. 10,000th degree polynomial curve chunks, lots of them. A number with over 3,000 digits, many of them. And smooth as silk. All right, now that the cat is out of the bag, let's discuss some properties of the row function. First, because of the way we set it up, it satisfies this equation. It is its own shrunk to half in time and doubled in amplitude derivative. And of course we can derive the next derivative from this by deriving the equation and plugging it into itself. So we get a 4 from the chain rule, the inner 2 remains, and then we can replace row prime of t via the equation above, yielding 8 row of 4t. And we can just continue like this for all higher derivatives. But what about the iteration stuff, you ask? Well, we are at the infinite iteration, so the next one is still the infinite iteration. So we don't need to care about iterations anymore. But what about the flipping? And we don't need the flipping anymore either. Either. Come with me, I'll show you why. We will now examine the domain. So far we only looked at the first bit of the row function for t between 0 and 1. But how does it continue? Well, we can just have a look at one of the derivatives to see how it continues, since they all look the same apart from scaling. The fifth one, for instance. If we zoom in on this little piece between 0 and 1, mm, aha. So we can just copy that. Up, down, down, up, and so on. Actually, this up and downing continues in a very well-known pattern, the two more sequence, or fair sharing sequence. I hope I pronounced the name of the first guy right. Apparently he's Norwegian. I don't, like, my Norwegian is not that great. Well, also, here's why I called it row function, by the way. Okay, but what about the negative half? How does it continue in that direction? Well, let's have a look. Here's the function, here's the derivative. If the first thing on the left side was an upward bump, then the derivative would look like this. The first bump there being a downward bump then. So the function would lose the property of having an equal shape as its derivative. Hmm. So there must be a downward bump in the position at first, right? Mm, wrong. Then we have the same problem, just the other way around. So how do we solve this issue? We just suck it up, get over the fact that the row function is only defined on the positive side and continue with our lives. And we will do that by doing a proper full in-depth analysis of the range of the function. It's between negative 1 and 1. Done. Let's sum up the properties that we have so far. We have the self-similarity with the derivatives. We know that the function is technically puzzled together from infinitely many, infinitely small polynomials of infinite degree, although every function can probably be seen like that, but you know what I mean. And despite being crazy piecewise, we still have infinite smoothness, or see infinity continuity as it's also written. And I must say that judging by the looks of it, my mathematical intuition tells me that this function is the optimal solution to something, but I haven't really found a suitable problem yet. But however, here's one more interesting thing. Although being smooth as an oily eel, the function is non-analytic. Not sure if it's non-analytic everywhere, but at least at countably infinitely many points on an arbitrarily small interval. Say what? We will investigate this non-analyticity and what that even means, and also many more interesting properties in the next video. And I'm sorry I leave you with this cliffhanger, but see, the thing is, initially I had all the content in one video, which was half an hour long, and I sent the first test version to some people that I considered my friends for review, and many of them still didn't watch it because they didn't get to it yet. Since I'm sure that everyone loves watching math videos, the only possible explanation I had is that it's just too long, so I cut it into two parts but I'll upload them both at the same time, so feel free to just binge watch all the two episodes at once. See ya!